services or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Triversity Talk on this sweltering Wednesday night. I am Wendy Stewart, your host, and once again, our guest co-host, Evan Lawrence. Hi, Evan. Hello. Good, good evening, Wendy. How are Why you? Do I even call you a guest anymore? You're not a guest because you've been on a couple of times. I'm recurring. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you. you know, <laughs> that's good. I'm gonna I'm gonna totally use that. How was your day today? Uh, it was good. I, I tried to move as little as possible. Um, how, I, how do you do that, Evan? You know, I'm, I'm recovering. I'm a little bit in mourning. I had to put my cat to sleep I on know. Monday and she was 13 years old, but she's she was really suffering. And it, I'm glad she isn't anymore. Right. It's, and, you know, because you're a spiritual person, she's um, in a better place. And I mean, the way all of us are with... I hate calling them our animals. I call my little menagerie my fur babies. And uh, to anybody listening that has dogs, cats, rabbits, chinchillas, or ferrets, they're our, our very good friend Jed Ryan has a, two ferrets. Um, you know, our fur babies are everything to us. Now, even with all of that, Evan, I, I know you were in mourning, but you, you did Bronx Pride. Tell us a little bit about Bronx Pride. That was very interesting. Um, uh, besides a two-hour trip up there and back, Bronx um, is far. It was like an outdoor coliseum um, hosted by Apollonia Cruz, who put this we love huge Fox. event together. And she definitely needs more help. I had a two-hour wait to perform, um, which was fine. You know, I, I enjoyed the whole experience, and it was great performing live in front of strangers uh, in a park in Cretona Park and. Yeah, that, well, it's the whole thing with like, because a lot of the shows that we do are in front of, you know, people in the entertainment industry or, you know, like-minded people, but it's a whole different ball of wax when you go somewhere and it's strangers. And then it's also in a park. So it's, it's not um, a selected audience. It's an audience that can just be strolling through the park. Yeah, it's true. And, and I, uh, I, was very successful with my first song. I'm not sure about the second one, but you know, I mean, this is this is a random crowd, so who knows what's going to happen? Listen, so, you know what? <laughs> Performers have to take risks, and you took a, a risk, and you were out there, and you did your thing, and I heard it poured as well. Uh, yeah, it's it actually poured while I was on the train. So oh, and no. when I got off, it just sprinkled a little and it was all gone. I was so like, then you weren't oh. singing in the rain then, Evan. It was all good. No, nope. it was great. <laughs> no singing in the rain for you. So uh, this Sunday, I am with the Imperial Court of New York. Uh, we're doing Christmas in July. And uh, I've written a really funny parody for it. Very clean, too, I may add. <laughs> Wonderful. And I probably will also hear them. A week from Friday on July yes. 29th at Otto Shrunken Head. I will have Easter another Friday Christmas. Show. I will have another Christmas in July at your show, Evan Lawrence, because you know mm. what? It's July, and we we need a little Christmas in July together. Um, yeah. So, right? Don't you agree that we have right to this very Christmas? minute? Right this very minute, and you know what? We need things, ladies and gentlemen, that keep us up and keep us happy. Um, I have got to these days, of course, what I say is I filter the news. I totally stay in touch with everything that's going on. And and certainly uh, if you go to Triversity site, Mary Weber Kraus aggregates the most incredible articles about any of the laws and anything affecting the LGBTQ plus community. I read that, but I in the world, I have to like kind of sometimes go la 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 la. I have to put my blinders on, right? Because 
there's a lot of stuff going on out there. And if you start paying attention to all of it, it'll make you not want to get out of bed. And it'll make the positive things that we all want to do in our life more difficult to do. So that's why tonight's guest is absolutely perfect to be here. Our guest tonight is a psychotherapist advocating and validating the marginalized and their allies. And tonight's guest also uh, works with uh, cognitive-based therapies and helps people achieving that wellness balance. I'd love for you all to meet Dwayne Brown. Thank you. Hey. Hello, Wendy. Welcome. Hi, Wendy. Hello, Evan. Hi. Sorry for your loss, Evan. Oh, thank you. Thank I you. I lost so one in Jane. I lost one in December. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Dwayne. And thank you for oh. saying that to um, Evan. Dwayne, did you lose um, a cat also? Not a cat. My um, Havanese of tw uh, 15 and a half years. Stop. Uh, oh. In December. It was, it was quite oh, tough. No. But um, yeah. Made it through it, but it was very challenging. Oh. So my heart goes out to you. Right. It, you. it is Thank very, um, it's very, very challenging. My last chihuahua, Mr. Fudge, uh, ate a rock at 14. <laughs> and oh, um, oh. oh, it was bad. But I, I did something a lot of people don't do. I gave myself a week. And, um, and you're a good person to talk about this with, Dwayne, because of what you do. I gave myself a week. And then I thought... I have a big void, right? Because you, you can never fill the pause of the the one that came before, but there's a void left and I couldn't live with that void. So I, I went online and I saw some puppies had been born outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And that's how I got Mr. Nugget. It, it is ironic because this one I'm so attached to. It's like, it's, it's sick. I want to do what the Mayans do. They, they were buried with their dogs. That's what I want. That Mama and Nugget will be buried together. We're, we're hoping you yeah. outlive your dog. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. But if it doesn't happen, and, and Dwayne and Evan, if you come to the funeral, just say, this is what she wanted. <laughs> You'll be my I'm glad you took care of I'm glad you took care of yourself. And, you know, there is no, um, you know, timeline as to when you should get a new pet or when you should start dating after a loss. It's like you need to do what you're what, what speaks to you. And I think it's really um, admirable that you took care of yourself. You knew that you couldn't sit and wait, that you needed that companionship. And you went and got another dog. Uh, um, dog. Yeah. Yeah. And I, thank you for for getting that. And yeah, there's not a day that goes by. I wake up every morning and I say, thank you universe for sending this wonderful soul into my life. Yeah. Listen, we all need to be able to take care of ourselves. Now these to me mm -hmm. are unprecedented times. Um, yeah. and, right. And I, you, you know, this now, uh, as a therapist, you just started, I know you've been seeing clients for a long time, but you just started your own business. Can you tell us a little bit about that little background? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I started, um, uh, I worked for an agency for many years. And then I also worked um, Tuesday and Thursday nights. I started a small private practice working with three people on Tuesday nights, three people on Thursday nights. And just as the pandemic, you know, during these times of, the, of this pandemic, um, the social work field uh, has definitely seen its, um, its growth, you know, um, so social workers, therapists, you know, we've always kind of been kind of like at the bottom of the rung and, and, and uh, when it comes to health care. But during yeah. the pandemic, people really came to understand how important mental health was. Um, and so in that, there was an influx of people coming to agencies, people coming to private practice, looking for support. And I just saw the opportunity. To, I've been with this agency for four and a half years, and um, I have a great mentor. And he was like, I think this is the time for you to, uh, you know, launch your, your practice. And so I, I did that. Um, wow. I resigned on May the 27th with six clients a uh, private practice clients and today i have 22. i mean oh it was pretty it was a pretty quick ramp up i mean it, it, i i wasn't expecting this at all but so, it's been amazing 
That that's mm-hmm. amazing. And I want to congratulate you, first of all, for growing your business since May to that degree. But the the other yeah. thing is, my God, that people need to take care of themselves to this degree because we're not being taken care of right now, right? No. Um, people that aren't seeing therapists, I mean, it's like anything goes out there. And with everything that came down during the pandemic, you know, I'm, we've all heard this. The United States is the richest country in the world, blah, 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 blah. You're right, Wayne. We completely forgot about mental health, that social workers and therapists were definitely lower on the totem pole. And and now I, I know most of my friends that are therapists, they are busy businesses are bursting at the seams. Yes. Oh, what is that? What does that say about our society? It's pretty tough out there right now. I mean, with the um, pandemic, with the political um, uh, scenes out there, the Roe versus Wade, the, the rolling back of Roe, uh, Roe versus Wade, um, and then this second you know, virus, um, you know, monkeypox. I don't know if you are familiar with that, yeah. but- Wayne, you don't know if you're not familiar with all of them. As a matter of fact, there's a brand new virus they just found in Ghana that's like Ebola and they're trying to contain huh. it, but they found it. Yeah, so keep going. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess what I want to say when it comes to the LGBT community, you know, we were quite triggered by um, the handling of uh, COVID. Um, for many reasons, uh, particularly people that survived the AIDS epidemic and also the families of those that didn't survive the AIDS ep- epidemic because, you know, it took the U.S. over two years to really step up to um, ha- to provide um, vaccine or provide uh, medications for HIV, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. And so people find themselves quite triggered um, around um, uh, COVID because COVID was a worldwide pandemic. It was um, uh, heterosexual people that were that were coming down with it and the world moved on it very quickly. Right. And so people found themselves very upset, very triggered by the way that um, the, the world handled COVID versus HIV. Right. And then you know, two years of living with this pandemic, um, this new monkeypox virus hits. And again, it's focused on the LGBT community and we can't get, and there's a, there's a monkeypox vaccine out there. It's been, I mean, we've had it and there's no, it's not available. It's um, not- and so again, people are finding themselves triggered and very upset by the way that the LGBT community is being handled around um, viruses. If you go, uh, there, this article I read it this morning, they profiled um, five different men with monkeypox, okay, and what they had to go through. Now, first of all, monkeypox is so painful. The lesions are absolutely so painful. They're in pain. They're calling, uh, a quote, unquote, these emergency numbers. Not only can't get the vaccine, but there's a couple of antiviral drugs that can lessen the symptoms. Right. They can't mm-hmm. they can't get those either. Finally, um, there were two people on there that seemed to know how to work the system that were able, I think, to get them through Bellevue Hospital. But to your point, you're absolutely right. It is like reliving, I mean, for me, because we ha- were part of a big AIDS organization in the 80s and I lost many friends, all of this is coming up again. I'm like, I, I can't believe yes. this is happening again because Okay, back then, they didn't, you know, we had, till they came up with the cocktails, every damn thing they came up with, one was just worse than the next. ACT killed so many people. But now, right, with all of the research and everything, we know there is a vaccine for monkeypox, and we know there's antivirals that can be giving people, and they're dragging their damn feet again. So, yeah, triggering, you're right. Yes, very true. It's it's absolutely triggering. Have you had um, clients express this concern to you regarding monkeypox? Yes, um, definitely had them, um, you know, concerned about monkeypox. Um, also finding themselves very triggered by um, COVID and just uh, kind of like rehashing um, the challenges of uh, the AIDS epidemic. Yes. Right. Definitely. So how do you how would you start with somebody who who is uh, feeling like we all do? I mean, how, how would you start 
treatment with them? Um, from a being triggered, um, I guess one would be to um, talk about and uh, well, it's trauma, right? So they, they, it's traumatic. I would definitely want to sit down with them and, um, you know, we would process the trauma, like sit down, talk about what is it that's triggering about this, identify the feelings that are attached to it, because trauma doesn't go away. Um, but what it, what you can do is as you process it and talk about it and actually able to identify the, the actual specific feelings, not just like I'm angry, I'm, uh, you know, really coming up with true, like I'm frustrated, whatever it is, but coming down with what it is that's truly uh, the feeling, um, mm -hmm. it starts disseminating. It starts name, losing name its, it so it isn't an invisible thing. Yeah. Ah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, because what happens is people end up stuffing their feelings and not really dealing with um, what the, you know how they're feeling and not dealing with the trauma of the uh, of the experience. Right. But that's you know what that's understandable and that's why they come to you, right? But in the world, in, in amongst our friends, amongst the gatherings and things that we go to, it, it's still people, I think the natural tendency is to put on a, a good face and not to show like what's happening in here. And I guess what's become so triggering for me because of the pandemic, right? I, so I came through um, the AIDS era and went into the nineties angry, Okay, too many people died. Um, uh, optimistic because there were people I was actually able to get those off-label drugs for, and they're still wow. alive. So that made that was a good thing I could hang on to. But the whole thing uh, that happened to the people that passed, to the families that lost their sons and daughters, right? Mm -hmm. it, it should have never should have never gone to that degree. And we all know, right? how it got that right. way. And you would think mm -hmm. we've evolved to now and we don't want to see history repeating itself. And yet, you know, I, I can tell you I'm watching, I read these maps where cases of this and cases of that and monkeypox is really growing. So before it ends up doing what happened with HIV, let's get a handle on it. Let's make the vaccines and everything available. Yeah, well, those in power aren't talking about it. That's they're talking about it, right? And right, Evan. Every minute they're talking about it, and and somebody's getting infected. Do you feel, Dwayne? And maybe this is a pointed question. Do you think if it were the general population and not? Uh, and by the way, I here's what I believe. I believe this monkeypox will be is going to be everywhere. Let's face it. H HIV predominantly started in the gay community, but you know what? Then, it, come on, it went. It, it, logic tells us these are viruses; they freaking spread. So, right. you know what? Do, what do we do as people? What can we do to make um, make things accountable? I mean, I have to tell you both, and and Evan, you know about this. Evan and I perform in bars that are very crowded. A lot of the time, people are mm -hmm. on top of each other. I, I won't even mention masking because they don't. And Evan, you know some of the clubs that, that we've been in. And yeah. it's yeah. a risk. And if you say anything to anyone, they look at you like, you know, you've got a horn coming out of your, your head or something. Um, you know, Evan, you've certainly been more careful than me through the this whole thing. I, I get sloppy, I admit it. I've had COVID three times because of it. I paid the price every single wow. time. But, you know, now with this monkeypox thing, they're, you know, they're calling it sexually transmitted, but there are cases, if you follow it, where it's been skin to skin. So, you know, I think of those sweaty bars and people on top of each other, they got to get on this, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the key is just people getting vaccinated, right. um, you know, taking care of yourself the best way that whatever it is that makes you comfortable. If it's not going to sweaty bars, if it's not, you know, I go to a gym and, you know, yes. it's like it's very easily transmittable through just skin contact or, you know, surfaces. So it's like, um, right. you know, I think the best thing to do is is to get vaccinated. Right. Um, but again, that's a challenge because the, the vaccine isn't available, isn't read, readily available. Mm -hmm. 
but but your job is i mean i'd say part of your job would be to help people live without fear ah yes yeah. well i don't know about live without fear but to have a healthy amount of fear yeah. um you know oh. to have a healthy um approach to fear it's yeah. okay to be fearful but you know are you isolating at home are you um you know being obsessive about it about about not going out um are you is it impeding your daily activities of living you know, fear yeah. motivates people. You know, it's like fear isn't necessarily a bad thing. So it's just making sure that someone has a healthy level of, of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they yeah, don't, really talking about that. it, processing it, um, you know, helping them come to understand that, you know, um, the, the, where they're at with their fear, fear level, they should consider, you know, um, trying to adjust that and be more, um, uh, Try to be open to uh, not being so fear-based. Okay. I, I mean, you're... I have a director I worked with that wrote a book, Fear is Good. I have to give you hmm. that book because it's got, you know, the picture from the scream? Who thought, wow. right? Who, who did that picture again? Edward Monk. It, right. So that, scre that screaming figure, it's on the, the cover of the book. And the book is about fear is good. And um, I agree with you, Dwayne. It's, it's, you know what it is? It's a healthy balance of fear, you know? Not being stupid, not being uh, selfish. You need to have, a, a, I think, a healthy balance of fear in your, in your life. Hmm. You know, because that's what makes you take the, the right steps. And you know what? You could roll this healthy balance of fear into the thing about self-care. Somebody comes to see you, Dwayne. It's about self care, right? Well, I just I commend anyone that that that, that comes to that, that seeks therapy. You know, there's a lot of people out there in the world. I mean, lots of people that never seek therapy. Right. I like to call therapy uh, the gym for the mind. You and know, I a lot of people come to therapy. A lot of people come to therapy in an acute situation like a breakup or, um, you know. So, some type of family issue, but there are also people come to that people that come to therapy just for the maintenance of their minds. You know, um, people go to the gym to work out their bodies. People go to the, th the therapist to work out their their minds, um, and um, it can be a very um, maintenance based uh, activity. You know, can definitely be a supportive way to um, be able to, you know, deal with certain things that are going on in your life. All therapy isn't necessarily like something bad going on. You know, um, therapy can also be a space to, um, you know, discuss ideas, dreams, um, you know, the, the things that you want to do, strategize your, your career, things like that. So it becomes a very supportive thing as as well uh i think the analogy that you gave of the gym is is really good i i go to the gym because it makes me feel good you know yeah. and it makes my body feel a certain way and then all of that makes me happy and then i have the energy that i want to have and therapy works that way too if you um like you said if you can discuss your dreams with someone and you can't always do that right with your friends yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing about therapy is you are meeting with someone that is typically unbiased, um, usually unbiased. That is, it's a confidential space. The only time that a therapist would um, report anything is if it, you said you were going to hurt yourself or someone else. So it's okay. confidential. Right. Um, and, um, you know, family and friends are great for some things, but, you know, they're always going to be putting in, not always, but a lot of times they're putting in their opinions on things. And, um, you know, sometimes they have, they have other motivations in, in their response to, to the things that you're trying to talk to. Them. Right. Right. You they know, also this is don't have the background or the training that you have. You know, obviously if you want to discuss things in a neutral field, I think your therapist, right, is a is a good person to do it with. That is a a neutral party, and that may you yeah. know that that makes sense. So, what made you decide to become a clinical social worker and therapist? So, um, I was in sales and marketing for twenty plus years, and I just 
basically got tired of my income being based on the economy. And I've always been um, a caring and thoughtful person. Mm -hmm. And um, I just saw this opportunity to um, do something uh, different, kind of out of the box for me. I I was literally a businessman. And um, I decided, I'm like, if I'm going to end up, if if I'm going to end up, um, if I'm going to change careers, I need to be doing something that I'm passionate about. And I'm passionate about people. I'm passionate about helping. People. And so um, I uh, own my own show. I was a women's wholesale fashion. Um, I had a women's wholesale fashion show. And um, can I ask what I label it was? On the wall. What, what label was it? What, what was your label? What was uh, your brand? Oh, no. So I, I my showroom was called Iconoclast Showroom, and I repped like eight, eight um, women's brands. Oh, I which had, I probably um, know because I work in the fashion industry. I mean, I'm listening oh, to what okay. you're saying. You're tired of your income be, being based on really the how frivolous the economy is. And I'm thinking, yeah, God, I, sh- I feel that way. <laughs> It was it was just very volatile, and I was like, yeah. "Oh my gosh!" Like you know, I'm getting I'm getting older, and I'm like, I gotta figure things out and do something right. different. But I, you know, it's funny because when I was a kid, all of my neighbors, like people, just used to always t- talk to me, and my parents used to actually get upset because grown men and women, my friends' parents, were always talking to me, and I don't know, I was just really good at listening, and so I. Um, I told my older sister, who was like my mentor at one point, I was like, I think I want to be a psychiatrist. And, you know, a psychiatrist is actually someone that, that um, uh, assesses someone's mental health and prescribes. And, yeah. prescri- and, and that's really not what I wanted. I, I really didn't want to be a doctor. Um, so anyway, it was just very interesting because um, I ended up, um, I ended up, meeting with, with a friend of mine that was a therapist. And I just said, hey, I think I'm interested in, in being a therapist. Um, I'd like to talk to you more about it. And um, they kind of showed me kind of like the ropes and, and what it would take. And I went back to school. Um, at 48, I went back to school to be a therapist. And um, I got my master's in uh, social work. And then I um, started immediately graduated and went to work for an agency. and then you have to accumulate two years and 250 hours of clinical based work. And wow. then you can become, uh, you can sit for the test to become a clinical. And, and um, don't support. you, don't you also have to um, go through therapy yourself? You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's not, no, you don't. Um, right. Now I believe that as a therapist, you should see a therapist. Like I definitely have seen it. I see a therapist. Um, and I've seen one for since I've been in, since I was in school, and I, and I saw one before I even came into the industry, into the field. Um, yeah. I'm really one of these people that find it to be very, very um, supportive. Um, Agreed. In my life. I mean, you have to show so much empathy and hear all these stories and people's lives. It must it must affect you. I mean, do you, it, what is your release to put yourself back in balance? Yeah. So you know. Um, Wellness and self-care doesn't stop with the client. It also is something that I have to do. To do. And there's different realms of wellness. There is physical wellness. There's spiritual wellness. There's um, mental uh, wellness and um, professional. Um, professional. I think I'm missing one. And social. So there's um, mm-hmm. social wellness, like socialization. Mm-hmm. There is physical wellness. There is professional wellness. There's spiritual we- uh, wellness and um, mental wellness. Right. So in those five realms, like I have different practices that keep me, you know, pretty balanced. Right. Um, and, you know, right. self-care, you know, people think the self-care is going and getting a mani and pedi. It's so much bigger than that. Yeah, really. You know, <laughs> you know um, in the professional realm, you know, do you set boundaries and, and make sure that you're, you know, working the amount of hours that you're comfortable working? Um, do you set boundaries with your boss? Um, you know, socialization. Are you getting out and, and making time for yourself and, and, and you know, your loved ones? Um, when it comes to physical, you know, I work out three, um, three to four days a week um, and I eat healthy and I drink. There's a lot of behavioral things in wellness. So, like, I, I, I drink, you know, 
six, six to seven glasses of water a day. I get eight, seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Um, I eat three square meals a day plus snacks. That's good. Um, you know, all of these things are things that keep me um, and a person that practices wellness um, uh, in a more balanced mood state. Excellent. Well, we, everything you're describing, um, I do. Uh, uh, but I'm very structured. And I have to yes. do this because I'm very structured. And not everybody um, totally understands the four times a week. For me, it's three to four times a week workout. Um, the setting and the boundaries, I find people have an issue with. And sometimes I get a little guilty when I start setting those boundaries. But you know what? That As you get older, you start to feel better about making those choices. That's what I want to say. Oh, absolutely. And, and the yeah. boundaries are yeah. really important. It was something I had a big issue with because I would let hours go by and get, you know, four, five, six phone calls, texts from people that I would say are EDing, which means emotional dumping. Because like uh -huh. you, I've always been a good person to talk to, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, my daughter inherited the same ability, but, you know, she's got me for a mom. So I, I told her, you got to be careful with friends that they're, they're not EDing your time. And you can't be afraid to, right, Evan, you know what I'm saying is true, to put up that wall and say, you know what, I have to go now, you know, and 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 that's it. It's okay to do that. Yes, the please boundaries. take your vampire teeth out of my neck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, Even I call emotional vampires, yeah, right? Yes. <laughs> right, get Most your teeth. Right, get your emo emotional vampire teeth out, out of my neck. But... You know, even to this day, I have to, I catch myself. I have to work to catch myself from um, doing that. This one thing I learned really from the pandemic, um, I came to a lot of self-realizations. Now you have a to lot understand. Of people did. Yeah, a lot of people did, and I've had people on, on my other show and even on this show. Oh, the pandemic was good because it made me do this that, and the other. The pandemic made me very angry, Dwayne angry because a career mm -hmm. that I had 45 years in stopped cold stove mm -hmm. stopped along oh, with right. The financial, everything like my world blew up and I'm like, this is unacceptable. So part of um, finding my space again was realizing what my power was. That was not a mm -hmm. victim. And I had to, and, and the thing, even with the power, I still, I still have to work on that. You know, Instead of waiting for the call, making the call, being the one, oh right. I know, I know you understand this, you know, initiating the call, being the one, I hate using this phrase. Who came up with this? Taking the bull by the horns. I hate that. Evan, do we have anything uh, better than that? What are we? <laughs> um, I could you twist that phrase around, but you're not going to like it. Oh, <laughs> is, is it right? <laughs> Grabbing by the canyones? <laughs> Something in that vein. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's being able to um, take your power back as a person. And and certainly for both Evan and I, the entertainment industry, the fashion industry, the level of, I think in those particular industries, Dwayne, the level of victimization is absolutely through the roof. Because... Well, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say... I worked for an agency that focused on people in the entertainment industry, but that was my last job before I went private practice. Okay. So I'm very, okay. very aware of how the entertainment community was affected by COVID. It was just like, not only from a financial aspect, but even an emotional, when yeah. your role, when your job is to, um, one that you um, are responsible for helping people emote, you know, and feel that is very different from someone that's an accountant. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's a very different thing. And to lose the ability to be able to um, express emote um, in the way that you're, that, that an entertainer is used to doing, like it can be such a loss. I, yeah. I dealt with a lot of people that were really grieving the loss of their careers. Yeah. If you worked in the entertainment industry, then you know, there was even this Facebook group 
of entertainers and all the support people in film and theater. It was called The Pandemic Came and Now I'm Left with a Great Big Hole. And there were people would just go on there. It was helpful. You know, you could you could well they gave tips on how to collect unemployment, right? But also oh, yeah. you could bitch and moan about how much this this sucked. Because, uh, you know, I have to tell you, Evan, I was happy for you, but you were able to work, you know, to keep your job during the pandemic. You worked from home. And yeah, you could- that, was a, that was a big surprise. Yeah. But but talking but was- about entertainment, I was I was punching a, a hole through the walls and doing the Zoom shows and Instagram and whatever I could do. So when it finally came about that we could perform live again, um, I just exploded onto the stage. Yes. I, I never Absolutely. appreciated it so much. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's, yeah. Well, what but did they say? You don't know what you got till it's gone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to your point, Wendy, about, you know, taking your power back, you know, there were so many people that started self-producing uh, their own content and, you know, maybe not making, not making great money, but just doing something that they could call their own was, was very satisfying. Right. And of course, still be able to get their, their unemployment if they needed to. And that's what kept them afloat, but just being able to still be creative in some uh, in some realm, some aspect. It was very gratifying. And that is exactly what, what I did. I developed three shows during that time. And one mm-hmm. of them got picked up by Glue TV, which is which is great. Very excited. Uh, financial opportunities to whole nine yards. But when I started all of this, I had no idea. But I was telling my guests on another show today, I had a great life before all of this. I did. Um, but I was forced, like, like many people to, as Evan say, creatively reinvent myself, put together a whole new package. And, and basically at this stage of the game, when I would have liked to be throwing bonbons in the air, I got to start over. And guess what? You are an inspiration to me, Dwayne, because at 48 years old, you decided, I'm going to quote that movie, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going back to school. Okay. I, I know I'd be good at this. You know, I'm a good listener. I like listening to people and you took the, it is a risk because that is still later in, in life. You know, when most people are still humming along, singing a song, you went and you went back to school for something that was different than you were doing. Well, when people have a hard time, I think people are getting better at it. Um, But sometimes I don't, sometimes people think that they're going to have the same career or in the same field forever. Um, and, you know, things change. Um, you know, there's ageism out there, you know, depending on what industry oh, you're in. Okay. It's like, you know, yeah, don't you even get, get forced out just by getting, you can be the best at your job, but if you're getting older, like it can be a challenge. Right. And you have to be able to reinvent yourself. You have to be able to, um, you know, because, Ego can get in the way, oh, like, I'm going to be fine. But, like, no, like, facing reality and being like, okay, what is it that I need to do next for for myself? And realizing that, you know, yeah, there's, like, maybe some change that needs to take place. Right. But it's still, okay, now we're getting back to the thing about fear, okay? Many (laughs) times, you, you know, it can be scary. It's scary to, you know, jump off of that cliff knowing that you're there's always a chance your parachute may not open okay so that's a little little scary and that's where the fear steps in but what you have to remember is you can't let that overtake you i have i call it the 3 a.m thing where i wake up with those i know evan you must have gone through this you wake up at 3 a.m and all of those thoughts are you know the what i call during the whole uh quarantine i I was waking up every night at like uh, three or four times. It was, it was something. (laughs) Right. I created for the 3 a.m. wake up with the what if thoughts. I created what I call the worry shelf. I imagine this shelf and it's across from my bed and I take one thought out at a time, these bad thoughts, and I put them on the worry shelf. And then I make sure my brain's all clean. And then I replace it with Happy, what makes me happy? Maybe I saw a bunch of flowers that day, or I love dogs, a, a particular dog that made me smile. But I feel 
at 3 a.m. I'll fill my brain with the positive thoughts. And most of the time I will fall right back asleep. But well, that's, that's, that's great to me. It's yeah, it's it's something, you know, I discovered myself. And listen, you know, people come to you as, as a therapist, what you're giving them, you're giving them the strength of self-discovery and in the empowerment that they can, you know, create stuff for themselves to get them through. You're not there 24 seven for them. And they've got to be able to stand on their own two feet and, and get through whatever they need to get through, which uh, brings me to um, the mindfulness based cognitive therapy. I know a little bit about this because uh, my daughter went for uh, CBT cognitive based therapy. And I remember the therapist giving her tools, right? Can you talk mm -hmm, a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Sure. So it's actually CBT, which stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Okay. And then there's also MBCT, which is Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. So what's the CBT? Yeah. So CBT is um, a little more concrete, mm -hmm. um, and it's about how to learn how to learn to reframe unhelpful thinking patterns. Ah. So, so you were kind of talking about that a little bit yourself about how you kind of reframe at 3 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Um, so there are 11 different unhelpful thinking patterns. Um, and oh, as humans, we each um, have two or three ride or dies. So a few of them are, I don't know if I have them all, but uh, catastrophizing, um, black and white thinking, comparing and despairing, um, mental filter, um, meaning only looking at one type of evidence, um, emotional reasoning, which is like, um, if I feel this way, it must be real. Like whatever they're thinking must be real. It must be, okay. So anyway, there's these different types of unhelpful thinking patterns. And CBT helps you identify your unhelpful thinking. And then from there, um, learn to reframe the unhelpful thinking. Um, and it's not easy. A, a visual no. of this would be like, um, if your mind was uh, a jungle and um, uh, if your mind was a jungle and you had this automatic thought, this way of thinking about something, uh, there would just be this path to the right that like the, the, the path is uh, the jungle path is cleared the vines are out of the way and you have this automatic thought or, or way of thinking about a certain thing yeah what cognitive behavioral therapy does is help you reframe that unhelpful thought and come over to this side of the jungle and start a new path and it doesn't happen overnight like um something happens, you have this unhelpful thought, and after you reframed and made this new way of thinking, you actually pause before you go down that old worn path, and you actually come over here and you go down this path, and you learn to just go, always go back, ah, I'm about to, I'm about to think, I'm about to cast, catastrophize, and you stop, you reframe it, and you literally get to the point where you go to this new path, the old path gets kind of, it's actually a neuronal pathway, this is really in your brain, so the neuronal pathway gets closed up, and the new neuronal, neuronal new pathway is the new thought. This, Evan, how fascinating is this? this is well, like no, I have to say because um, some things have taken me years and years and years just because how I was brought up with a severe narcissist who would put me down a lot. And there are certain things in my mind. And I found myself lately, I'm, I'm doing well with this, is that um, I, I found that I was putting myself down about certain things. And I, I said out loud, I said, I said, stop it. Stop putting yourself down like yes. that. Yes. And, and I was That's like, called labeling. I was like, wow, I, I'm, I'm actually saying it out loud. And, and I didn't even realize that it was so far back in my mind. I was going that much deeper and stopping myself from doing that. That is really great, great um, training of the mind. Yeah. I, the whole I, I, idea is that. The idea is that you should control your mind, not your mind controlling you. You know, we can find ourselves an automatic pilot and our just, we just think, 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 and 
we have to slow the mind down. And that's how uh, um, we get to mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So um, the formula for CBT is quite concrete in the way that you're, you're trained to reframe, whereas MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, is a lot less structured, and it's around being mindful. Um, back to the CBT real quick. So when it comes to CBT, there's cognitive behavioral, and the reason it's called behavioral, or why behavioral is in the name is because a lot of times if you will change some of your behaviors, like drinking, you know, six glasses of water, um, getting seven to eight hours of sleep, um, eating three square meals, your mood state will even out watching your alcohol or substance intake. All of those things um, titrate your mood state. Right. And so if you will, um, if, if you will um, pay attention to your behaviors, you'll find that you're less um, uh, you, you'll find that you are able to um, reframe unhelpful thinking much easier. Mm. By yeah. observing when your it comes own behaviors. By, when, by, by observing your own behaviors, by paying attention yes. to your Yes, behaviors. yes. And so CBT is there, right? But then mindfulness is really about being more mindful in your in your existence in your day like being very mindful like literally like one of the first things i, I train people to do is to be mindful for regular activities of living so like be mindful as you're i give them homework of like being mindful while they're washing the dishes so from the moment you pick mm -hmm. up the the dishwashing liquid and the moment you squeeze the, 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 the dishwashing liquid onto the plate and then the sponge on the, the, on the um, plate and your hand, like, is the water warm? Is the water cold? Like, you know, being very, just brushing your teeth and actually paying attention to every tooth. Like when you can find your, when you start slowing down and being more mindful, um, you will find that your, um, your mood state evens out that that's real wow mm -hmm. i've i have learned so much from you we're we only have like a few minutes left but first of all thank you i so this state of mindfulness okay. as you were saying it it made me think of that saying take time to smell the roses walking over to yeah. the rose and and smelling it and You're smelling um, it yes if if i'm guilty of anything it's <clears throat> i don't do anything of what you just described. Everything is like a, a, a automatic pilot, if you will. So um, I wanna see what happens in my brain when I, I take time to try some of this. Um, really, yeah. really, really great. Real quick, cause we only have two minutes left. Um, you're a Buddhist. <laughs> how, um, how much of Buddhism do you apply to your everyday life? and some of what we talked about tonight. So um, it's the art of sitting. Um, you know, it's like, I definitely, uh, I will say this. I practice uh, Buddhism very regularly for a very long time. And uh, the last couple of years, just based on the, the pandemic, which you would think I would be go t toward it, but I was so busy at this agency and so influx that I kind of got away from it. And I just went on a six wow. day um, BIPOC silent retreat um, and it totally hit the reset button. That's so powerful. So I feel centered. I feel back wow. um, kind of like in my skin and no, Buddhism plays a big part. Now I'm very careful when it comes to um, working with people and, and, and I'm talking about Buddhism and they don't know that I'm talking about Buddhism. Right. Like it's it's a fine line. Like some yes. people are very sensitive around religion or spirituality. Mm -hmm. So I, I I I share tenets and, and pieces of it in my work, but I don't um you know I, I try not to they, they don't they're being they're being exposed to Buddhism and they don't even know it, basically. Well you kind of it sounds like you universalize it so it, it can apply to all kinds of belief systems because I, I practice yeah. uh, uh, a Native American uh, yeah. tradition for many, many years. And um, it has to do with silence and and all the things that are not said and what's in between the words. Um, and the words? sounds exactly like what I do. So 
Yeah. Well, before we go, um, first of all, thank you. Second of all, I can use a lot of what you talked about tonight because I realize yeah. my sitting state, I'm ready to jump out of my skin <laughs> if I'm not doing something. <laughs> always. Okay. No, Evan, you know that. I'm always. I think I'm you in a 15-minute meditation, guided right. meditation to get you started. That would, that would be great. And um, yes, I know you plan on doing workshops and things like that. And I would be interested in I coming do. to the workshop. So you'll keep us in the loop. Before we go, I always take one quick picture. Thank Everybody you. say cheese. Thank cheese. you, Dwayne. Thank you so much. Um, Thank I wish you. you Thanks for having me. Oh, so much love with your practice. Evan, it was very nice to meet you. Yeah. Thank oh, you'll you see so more, of, more of Evan. You definitely will. And maybe you can come to some of our shows. I'll give you the information. Got a bunch of stuff coming up. Thank you, everybody who tuned in tonight. We will see you next week. Please stay cool, stay calm, stay collected, stay focused, and take time to smell the roses. Good night, everybody.